Hello, welcome back to PowerShell Garage. I'm your host, Alex. Today, we're back on the 72C10. You've seen it before if you've watched the LSWAT video. If you and the other 10 people besides my mom have seen it, you should check it out. Today we're doing a classic auto air install on the truck. It is similar to vintage air or retro air or old air, whatever. I did some research, picked classic auto air because they had it. And that, that's not the big part, is having it. And also they have a slightly different system where the heat coil and the, so the heater core and the AC condenser are two separate pieces. And in my opinion, that's gonna work better for heating and for cooling. I could be wrong, I'm not an AC expert, but that's why I went with this kit. Um, didn't see a lot of information on YouTube about installing these kits at all, especially not on a C10, which is strange because everything else for C10s is, is already out there. So I thought, hey, you know, I'll make a video, try to get you guys in here, show you every step that you probably need to know. Um, maybe not little simple stuff like draining a radiator or taking out a couple bolts that you should probably know how to do if you're putting an AC in but I'll show you as much as I can. Hopefully, it'll actually help you out. Uh, this is a non-AC truck, so we'll be drilling the holes in the dash, and I got an under dash vent for the center vent, so we don't have to cut that square hole. If you guys have seen it, you know what I'm talking about. I don't wanna do that, and I don't wanna lose my speaker up there on the dash, so we're going with the under dash vent for that one. Um, I'll get you guys in here. I did a couple activities before the camera started rolling. I know, see, I said I wasn't gonna do that and then it happened. Um, I knew that behind my factory heat box under the hood was not painted. So my day zero work, I wanted to get in there, get that box out of the way and get some paint on there so I could dry before we got really into this thing. But essentially I just removed the heat box and sprayed some paint. You know, that, that's all that's been done. Oh, and you know, and right here. I took my air intake off. This is custom, so no one's is going to be the same as mine. Same with the cruise. Got it out of the way. What has been done is the factory heat box and blower motor unit has been deleted. Um, there's a right way to do this. I didn't do that. I took most of the bolts out, and then I pried it off the firewall with the pry bar. And uh, it broke. It's, it broke, you know. Sometimes that happens. All right, now we're supposed to remove this USB cable. Yeah, don't worry about that guy. We're supposed to remove the heater controls, the radio, which I'm probably not going to remove, and the heating box. And I have the wrong size wrench. Great. Okay. Third time's a charm. It's like a USB cable. Got some tension on it. Okay. Save on our light fixture. There's a power connector for the fan. And supposedly we're supposed to undo these cable deals. which look like they're about a quarter inch. Unhook these three, take the cables off, and then you can take the controls, separate them from the box. Okay, remove the retainer, and you can remove the rest of the cable, and the controls are out. That sucked. Now to go ahead and remove the rest of this box, I can see that mine has a Phillips screw 
That's interesting. What else we got? Some bolt action going on. There's a 716 bolt under here. Mine is kind of mismatchy. I had some that were 716 and some that were 38. So I don't know if that's normal, expected, or what you're going to see on yours. But I'm pretty sure these go through the firewall off the other side. I think it's time for power tools. Power tools for the win. You know, a carpet with that one. Does that do anything? It's moving. Pick up this random bolt screw if I can even get it out. I feel like that's supposed to be a bolt, but I don't know. I've owned enough Subarus to know that they put Phillips screws all over the place. Okay, now would be a good time to take out your glove box. Mine is completely full of junk. I don't know if you guys can hear these birds, but it sounds like a Mighty Carmods video up in here. Be careful and pull your little glove box door limiter piece out without screwing up all of your paint. There we go. Once the door's off, the glove box kind of goes in to come out. Mine is in great shape, as you can see. All right. That was painless. And I see at least one more bolt. And then the other side of our wire connector, which goes to the resistor. For the blower motor. Don't need that where we're going. Oh, that one's not even rusty. That doesn't look right. It doesn't belong. Easy on your defrost duct. Mine's covered in black tape. From, who knows, 1972, probably. I was able to just pry up on the the duct to get it off of the blower motor or whatever gearbox words they're hard all right took some insulation with it but it appears to be coming out oh, i hooked the speaker wire and this wire Great success. With that done, it looks like we're moving under the hood to put the little cover over the round hole. All right, so we're supposed to install this cover over where the blower motor went. This, it looked like it was gonna be metal, but it's actually plastic. And as you can see, it is not smooth. 
whatsoever. It's been scratched, so that's annoying. And it just comes with uh, a couple of self-tappers to drive into the firewall. I think Full Barn Garage would approve. So apparently you have to grab your 8mm for this, for some reason. That's the size of the little self-tappers they included. And then this guy is supposed to just go in here somewhere and cover up this hole. That's a little better. I apologize for some of the lighting on these shots. It sucks. I don't know what I'm doing. Anyway, that cover's on there with one screw. I'll get the other two zapped in and we'll move on to the next step. Three self-tappers. 16 hours later. Alright, so this thing goes in this hole. This isn't spelled out well in the instructions, but it looks like we're using one of these holes up here to put hardware through. So this little wire connector has to actually come out. And our old wire can just go back through the firewall. And then this is one of those little tabs for the insulation. And it looks like it needs to get out of the way as well. I guess when they wrote these instructions, it was on like a torn apart truck. There's the top two bolts roughly installed. I went ahead and threw nuts on the back sides of those just so I don't lose everything. Now I'm supposed to drill an 11 16 hole. You can choose to use a pre existing hole as long as it'll be lower than the drain nipple. And the diagram shows it being that hole right there. That you're using as your pre existing hole. 11 sixteenths. a very bad smell. I'm going to finish this from the inside because it's going to be easier. Yep, she's low. Drills also chamfer for both sides, so that's neat. Reading these directions, it says to go remove the evaporator unit and defrost assembly from the box and put it together with two screws, and then discard all that stuff you just did and install the DER, which is the control unit. So I'm gonna go ahead and install the DER control unit next, and then we'll do the rest of the stuff. All right, here's the classic auto air. There, DER digital something or other control unit, and it came with these two lamps that go inside of it so you can see it at night, which is nice. 
except that they're not in the same style as the factory, which is a single wire lamp that grounds out in the assembly. This is a two wire lamp. So I want to make a wiring harness there really quick. And my plan for this is that I'll just lengthen the ground wire a little bit, put a ring terminal on it, and we'll hook that to the dash right here where we're working, right behind the heater control. And then for the other side, we can just put a connector on it and hook it to the factory wiring for ground, or sorry, for a dim lamp. We already have that one in the heater control. We'll just put a connector on it. So I'm using these uh, solder stick style connectors. This is Pastronica from Amazon. Solder stick, I think, is the name brand. They're a little bit more expensive. These are the cheap ones. Same concept, though. You, you get it hot. The plastic shrinks. The blue stuff is glue, like hot glue that melts. And the center part is solder. And it melts and flows into the joint. Makes a really strong connection that doesn't leak out. And it's waterproof. Blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. The other thing about these that's important is that you hold them straight until they cool. Otherwise, the solder will harden at a weird angle. So for the blue end, I got this high quality set of Amazon connectors. There's a one barrel type connector in the kit. Two pieces to it. You got connectors that's male, female, and inside of those are terminals that are opposite. So the male connector gets a female terminal. Female terminal gets a male connector. Bada bing, bada boom. Wires go in. So does the boot. And I kind of missed. Normally this pin grabs the boot. Wow, focus. This crimp grabs the end of the boot and that crimp grabs the wire. In our case, wires in both, the boot's kind of in neither. The boot's kind of just hanging out in the rhubarb there. This goes into the connector and see the boot kind of slid back because it's not held properly in the crimp. but you get what you pay for around here. This other end will go in the truck where the connector goes. So here's our factory lamp. Deleted. Like I was saying before, you wanna put the little rubber boot on first before you strip the wire back, makes it way easier. And then when you strip the wire for these connectors, you only need less than a quarter inch. Around an eighth of an inch, probably. The wire sticking out. Make sure it's nice and corroded and kind of green looking. If your wire doesn't look like the Statue of Liberty, then it's not classy. You know, it's got to have that look to be considered a classy wire. Got our connector in the crimper. Run this through. This time I'll actually get the boot in the stupid crimp like that. That's how it's done. Boot in the crimp, outer crimp, wire in the inner crimp. Now this is a crimper that does them both at the same time. They actually came with the set. Is it a good crimper? No. Does it work? Yes. Since that wire is kind of small, I'm going to do a second pass with the next size down. There's numbers on these. Who knows what they mean? And then this wire, just like the other, goes in the connector. 
like so. And this plugs into here. Like so. And there you go. Now we have connections to there for the lamps. And we're able to unhook this anytime to service without having to take the bulbs back out of the unit. Not that that's that important, but I don't like making hard wire connections in the truck. It's a way easier to use crimp style connectors when you're already in the truck, in my opinion. We'll put the little lamps back in. And then all we have to do is connect our ground to one of these screws as we put it all back together. Which is probably going to be easier said than done. And I put my screws on the workbench. Now while you guys weren't looking, I went and put a bigger ring terminal on this end. And this time it's a shrinky dink style so even this one has a shrinky dink on it not that it matters because it's a stupid walmart style connector and it ain't gonna hold up the factory one just kind of sits more in the opening and this is kind of just sitting behind the opening but it works okay with that the ber is installed All right, here's the classic auto air unit in all its glory. I installed the defrost duct with two screws. I'm sure you can handle that. This thing just popped on. Doesn't look at all like the picture. That thing doesn't, I mean. But the rest of it does, looks fine. Running through my erections. Of course, the next step is to go ahead and just install it. Which is gonna be really easy to do by myself. Because it says you're supposed to have two people. And then once it's in place, you got to put a bolt and a nut through it into somewhere. Haha. -ha. Down there. So that might be interesting to try to do by yourself. Since it says that two people are needed for this stuff. Make sure you have two people when you do this. I'm glad I got the camera rolling for this. Because this is probably going to be hilarious to watch me try to put this in by myself and get covered in sticky black stuff. So roll it up behind the dash somehow. That requires some significant rolling because this plate. You have to roll it forward. Yes. Roll it forward. Nope. There's really not a way to get them through more straight. They kind of have to go through from this lower angle. this out and take a look at the back at it really quick. We can all take a look at what's going on. So these heater hoses, oh I see, they're on like a rubber connection. Um, they're probably in the right place. I don't really want to dink with moving them around. I think that this could probably be a little closer to this liquid line, but could just be that this line needs to move down. Just looking at the spacing in the firewall, I would say that this line needs to be more like here. Both of them need to be like there. So, probably in theory what we need to do is just bend these down as much as we can to get them to go through. And then when these two go through, they're going to have to move more in line with each other just because of how the holes are in that plate.
All right. All right, I'm gonna go whittle this cap down and put it back on. I can thread it back on and see if that decreases the diameter enough that it'll actually go through the firewall now. Yep, sure did. Now the expansion valve stuff is still kind of hitting the firewall over here, the inside of the cab. Not sure how important that is. But it's over there. Okay, and with that, it's all the way through. I just got to find a way to hold it like this. That's a good use of a tennis shoe. There. See? Two people. They got to go put a bolt through and then come back. Alright, so from what I can tell from outside, the unit's a little bit low. Which is shocking because it's held in by a shoe. Um, on the right side, I'm, I'm topped out. Like there's... No way I can get it any higher because it's touching the inside of the cowl. The left side can come up a little bit. Okay, so prying up on the whole unit and also prying up on the bracket, I was able to get the bracket to drop through the firewall hole up against the plate. Looks like it's in place now. Yep, got it. All right, that is tight. So now the next step is this top piece up here, which you guys probably can't see at all. Top plate up here, it's attached to the firewall with a couple self tappers and there's three holes and only two self tappers that's interesting so it's supposed to be level with the dash which to me means oh yeah quite adjustable left side needs to come down a little bit for me i'll set these two to be plumb with each other and then it's supposed to be tipped back as much as possible which is not going to be a lot but i'll do what i can all right, I apologize. The camera cut out when I put the self-tappers in. But you guys were up here at this angle anyway, so you really wouldn't have been able to see them go in. Basically, I just shot in a self-tapper there and there. Uh, when I shot them in, it did tip the unit back a decent amount more because it pulled it up tight against the dash. It is very tight now up here. and You can see back there what I was talking about, how tight that uh, expansion valve is up against the, the dash. I don't know what that screw is there. It looks like a ground for something. That wasn't me. I'll, I'll take that out. Um, but yeah, the unit's in, self tappers are in, and it is as level as I could set it against the bottom of the dash. So I kind of just used a camera like that to see that the case seam lined up with the opening on the club box. Um, Got a couple of like wiring things in the way. This is my antenna wire, so it kind of loops over the unit now. And then this wire is just for the radio. It's like a you know ESP port. So you can see the fitment. Oh god, the wiring! Don't look at the wiring. You can see the fitment up on the dash there. Control unit's hanging down still, of course. But yeah, look how much less floor space it consumes than the original box. All of this was covered before by the factory air box and you couldn't actually see that wire right there or that one both of those wires were hidden behind the air box and now look at that it's like eight inches of wire it's hanging out i'm gonna have to hide somehow you can also see a whole bunch of the firewall insulation you couldn't see before that's neat
But yes, the unit is installed. Uh, we can take a look at the outside. So here's the lines poking through. There's definitely a lot of gappage around them, so if it doesn't come with something to seal that, I'll get something to seal those off a little better. Uh, the heater hoses are kind of facing upwards, which is I, I thought was going to happen because the just the way that they're oriented in there. And then two other fittings, but I mean, that is way less intrusive than the factory setup. All right, so the kit includes this uh, drain tube, and then there's a looks like there's a 90 degree fitting for it also. Uh, I'm not sure how long I need, so I'm gonna send it through and hook it up. Um, you can actually see where it goes from this side. I'm gonna hook that up, and then I'll cut it and put the 90 in it and face it downwards. Yeah, this kit contains uh, a 90 for the drain. Yeah, I feel like there might have been a better way to do that. So for whatever reason, the directions call for two different, or the same size of heater hose on both connections, which I'm not a fan of. Um, here we go. They're saying it's 5 eighths diameter hose, which I thought, okay, you know, if you included the hose, Cool, but you didn't. So my setup uses a five eighths and a three quarter because the return is bigger. Been to the parts house. I'm back. Get this water valve hooked up. Uh, like I was saying earlier, it has a flow direction. They put some little tags on there that I took off already, but basically you're coming. From the return side of your heater core, which doesn't really matter which one it is, but I think they have indicated the left one. I'll double check. Returning back through your valve and then to the return on your water pump. On the LS, that's the, the one towards the front. Let's get some hose going. I really like these nut drivers, putting stuff like this together. Need to lube these up a little bit. All right, those are severely over tightened. Great. Yeah, we could just zip tie the hose together there. Probably clean it up a little bit. I don't like this new hose I got. It's kind of flat. I don't like that. I'm going to cut off this part that's been clamped before. These clamped ends of these hoses get all screwed up and they split real easily, in my opinion. Now this is a three-quarter hose, which is not per the instructions. But we'll just crank it down. As one does. All right. So I'm going to take this old hose off, and I'm probably going to end up taking a shower and cool it, even though I've already drained everything. <clears throat> yep. It wasn't that bad. It's about right here. This is actually for cutting conduit, but these things are great at cutting hoses. And fingers. All right. I'll let you guys take a look.
a little closer, maybe. So there's the two hoses coming off the heater core and then the connection to my LS water pump. And this bigger hose was reused, so it's a little bit different color for right now. I think I got you guys in here the best I can with these wiring shenanigans. There's a few connections that have to happen on the unit itself. Looks like three. And then two connections to power, probably one or two connections to ground. And then we got some stuff to run out into the engine bay for like the high low pressure switch. Or to the electronic water valve. That should be it. There is a note about attaching the ground directly to the battery cable for the battery terminal. Yeah. We're not running on the ground all the way out there. The cab's grounded very well. It's well enough for the terminator to run. I'm pretty sure it'll work for this. So I think that I'm going to mount. my ECU for this, this black plate that's right above the unit. I think it's kind of bolted into the cowl. I just wanted to get my wiring connections on here and then see how much room I have to screw that in. And, you know, toss a self-tapper in it, of course. All the other connections are self-tappers, so why can't mine be a self-tapper? Of course, we gotta go fishing first. All the wires neat organized and tangled. Okay. I'm pretty good with these screws. I don't want to brag, but uh, I only dropped them about 25 times. These guys are just like the little pan head self tappers that electricians use all the time. That kind of screw. It is leaving a bunch of metal dust on my AC, so that's cool. There we go. Try not to get that in the fan. It's good for it. Okay, so the ECU is mounted now, totally level, above the unit on that black plate. So that part is done. Uh, there is a yellow harness, the first one I grabbed, apparently goes to some sort of deal bob that's down here. It does some stuff, apparently has a plug on it, so oh yeah, sure enough. So I might drop this back down the back. Plug it into this, must be like a little servo motor for the blend doors. I'm not in love with how low that wire connector is just hanging down underneath the dash. I don't really know what else to do about it, but yeah, whatever. So it is. The black one's already plugged into the water valve, so that's done. There is a blue wire and it goes to a thing. Where does this go? To one port on this little thermal switch thing that's up here, it looks like. There's actually two blue wires in here. Okay. Yep. So those apparently both go onto this little guy here. They're not really labeled. That definitely does a thing. Thermostat type thing, maybe? Oh, I need another self-tapper for this relay. Nope. Gonna reuse the one from the ECU. If I can. I'm not sure if this self-tapper's got enough thread on it for that. 
We'll find out. Oh, yeah. There we go. Now the relay and the DC are mounted. And the wires are all twisted. Neat. This is kind of weird. This is like not loomed up at all, and it's just kind of dangly bits around. I'm sure this does something important. I just don't know what it does. I just don't know why this is like this, and these are the way they are, you know? Organized a little bit. Looks like this is going to need a zip tie. Put that there for now. Oh, wow. That just exploded. Get there we go. And then this goes to the blower motor control because that's the only thing left that's not plugged in. That's also gonna need a zip tie because she's low. Okay, that's a thing. Put that in there right now. So now we're left with purple, white, and red over here, and then red and black on the other harness. Let's see. White goes to that switch. That's interesting. So it shows two wires coming out of this relay going into a single heat shrink, as we have here. But then only the white wire is continued, and it goes to the high-low pressure switch. So, what is the purple wire for? It's just like the normally open or normally closed part of the relay. One, two, three, four wires going off that relay. Oh, those come out of the same pin. The white and the purple. So, I would assume we don't even need the purple wire. Because they're, yeah, they're coming off the same pin. And then these reds are, okay, split. And then the blue is the trigger wire currently. So the ECU sends power on this switch determines if it actually goes. And then white and purple send power to your AC. So purple must be like a fan kick or something like that. So I could use this purple wire to tell my terminator that the AC is on instead of using a trinary switch to do that. You can just do it with a normal binary switch and just tell it you have 12 volt input to let you know the AC's on. It's not great to do 12 in when you could do ground, but it's already done. And I can return the trinary switch I bought. See, it's, that's all documented here in this single page diagram. Nope, sure isn't. So this 12 volt power then is just power to run the AC compressor has its own 20 amp fuse and a wire that is not capable of carrying 20 amps out to the air conditioner compressor. So that's way oversized. And then this has a 20 amp fuse also, and it's the main power, which includes the blower motor, which actually, okay, it's the same size wire at least. So there, that, that's good. Looks like it's actually teed off. So we're gonna use the existing power that was feeding the fan control. The reason for that being is that it already has a 20 amp fuse and it's already switched. And so that will make a good solid 20 amp input connection using the totally good, clean, solid old wiring in the truck. Nope, don't strip that yet. It'll put a connector on it. So this can be considerably shorter. And then our ground that's running out to the battery post or whatever. Yeah. I'll find a ground in here for that. Surely the cab is a solid ground. Since I don't have a wire connector, a nice pluggable wire connector that's, that's 20 amp capable, uh, we're going to go back to the solder type connectors. And we're going to solder this connection. That way we just don't have to worry about it. 
So since we're soldering, let's expose a little bit more. I like to expose a little bit more of the wire. Those are 12s stranded. I think this is actually a 14, even though it's carrying 20 amps to the fan motor. Oof. Oof da. Oh no, it's just dirty. Okay. Back in the day, 72, you know, they were a little. They were a little less giving with the wire. Wire was probably not that expensive, but for some reason we had to act like it was expensive. And, you know, if you had a 20 amp circuit, you're not getting no number 12. Especially with the distances involved, it's, it's fine. But voltage drop sucks. And these bigger yellow solder connectors they take a lot of heat to get the solder to melt probably better to use like a little mini butane torch than a heat gun but the heat gun gets the job done yeah i'm not in love with that connection but i'm sure it'll work and if it gets hot it'll just melt the solder some more <laughs> oh it's gonna burn the chuck down looks like i basically have to run my own wire for the AC deal. So I'll run that out under the hood and then we'll come back and connect up to that one once that's done. And we'll probably run it right here somewhere. Let's leave these dangler for right now, I suppose. This ground is just gonna go right over here into the cab. Of course, I didn't bring a connector for it. <laughs> These particular Walmart connectors crimp like crap. And then you're supposed to heat shrink them for some reason. I don't know what that's going to do after they didn't crimp well. Let's see if I can burn myself with a heat gun. Yep, burnt myself. I knew it was coming. Now, can I get my drill on that? Grounded. Okay. Now I just need to grab a key and see if the dang thing works. See if we're getting power out to this. And then we can continue on. Let's see if I can let smoke out of this thing. Fuel pump works. Fans blowing. I think it pulls in air from the top and the bottom, maybe. And it's set to dash right now. Yep. Ooh. Floor. Yep. Defrost. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's all working. So no difference between heat and cool, but I heard the valve open. And I can hear the relay actuating for the AC compressor. That seems to be all working. Say it works. Very nice. Now, one of the things you guys might want to do after you organize your wires, and this is not very well organized, but it's the best that I'm going to do. Um, you might want to come back and wrap some of these things in like foam tape, especially like these plastic connectors, the fuse holders, um, 
and other spots where the wire is kind of loose. If you don't, you'll get little rattles and vibrations down the road from like this little plastic connector will sit here and tap when you're going down the road. And it gets annoying like that. So one of the things that I've liked to do is get some of that foam tape, like Home Depot insulating type pipe tape for pipes and just wrap it around the outside of your connector here, here, wherever else you think you're going to, you might get a rattle from plastic rubbing on plastic. And that'll help reduce your vibrations. I'll let you guys get in here and take a look and, and judge me. So there's the ECU mounted up top with that relay mounted next to it. This is mounted on that black plate. There is my wiring. It's all zip tied together into a big nest. Like I said, there's better ways to do this than, but you can't see it back here. So I'm just not that we're worried about it. There's the two wires that go to the compressor. Well, one goes to the compressor and I suppose the other is going to go to my terminator and I can return the trinary switch, the Amazon. Oh, if you guys are looking at classic auto wear, they want like $45 for a trinary switch. The one on Amazon was like $10 for the exact same part number. You can see the part number in the image. So don't overpay for a trinary switch. It was totally not necessary. Here's the rest of the wiring. You also see my stereo wiring in there. Feel good. Stereo's not even done yet. There's the rear speakers that I don't have installed. And I thought I saw a wire harness. Yeah, there we go. That was tight now. Okay, there we go. Okay, my next step is the the frost vents. One of the reasons I wanted an updated AC kit is I have not had defrost on my driver's side since I've owned this truck. For several years it's been. I have not had driver's side defrost, which is fine unless you drive it like in the spring when it has freezing fog. Yeah. All right, so this looks pretty simple. It's just a bag of hose here. Those look pretty premium, about the same length. Came with zip ties, it's approved. And then there's two adapters. There's a passenger's adapter and a driver's adapter, I would assume. And these are basically just necking it down into the smaller tube that they use. Some evil little metal clips inside of them, but those clips didn't line up with my louvers inside of my vent, so I had to move mine. And they're kind of hard to move. I'm going to scooch it over a little bit to line it up with the holes, the louvers in this vent. Hopefully that's going to work now. Crack. Be careful when you're putting these on because they're old and they'll crack easily, apparently. Don't don't be like me and crack your defrost vent. Fortunately, it's not really not that noticeable, but I did just crack it, as I'm sure you all heard. All right, so you put your rubber on <laughs> and secure it with a zip tie. Oh, what are their zip ties? Not your Mighty Car Mod zip ties. Use their zip ties. Which are barely long enough. Hoping the AC is good, because some of the other stuff in this kit, quality is suspect. It's really mostly just miscommunication from instructions, but, you know, it makes me wonder... Should I have gotten vintage air? No, I've done a vintage air kit also, and I still think that we're in the lead as far as like kit and instruction quality goes by a little bit. This isn't perfect, but vintage air's instructions and the quality of the parts in their kit, they're not great. If you love vintage air, then we could say that these two things are on par, but that's as good as I'm going to give you. Don't pop that in yet, it's in the way. Okay, so my defrost vents, I don't know about both of them. No, not both, but the passenger side one is actually touching the the firewall right now. It's like it's jammed. So it's gonna be a little bit tricky to get this hose on. Actually kind of have to pull out on the AC unit. You should update your instructions and have people put these on before you do this before you install it just put the defrost tubes on 
before you install the whole AC box. They'll be in the way, but I think it's better than this. I think I could be wrong. I'm not going to zip tie that yet. Let's do the driver's side next, and then we'll get the zip ties on. The driver's side is a little bit trickier on this, just on these trucks in general. There's not very much room to run the tube over. Now it's going to get graceful as I get onto the dash to try to figure out how to route this thing. Get them fall back down now. Yep. Yeah, that was very graceful. Like a ballerina. Oh, there it goes, stinking away. Almost lowered it. This goofy thing here is my phone mount. It's actually pretty neat. It's a wireless charger slash phone mount. And the cool thing about it is that when the wireless charging starts, it closes the mount. So it knows your phone's in there when you drop it on. No, it's unplugged, but <laughs> that is how it works. You drop your phone on there, the wireless charging starts, and then it closes the little fingers, which is cool. And there's like a little button to eject it when you're done. That's my truck GPS. And then I have a classic auto sound radio with Bluetooth. Oof, that's a hand cutter if I've ever seen one. Let's just put that down. Yeah, there we go. No one will ever know. Check me out for defrost. Now it's time to drill holes in the dash. Great. All right, I went and snagged one of these pert near microscopic vents out of the bag. This thing is small. I mean, it better blow a lot of really cold air because that, that vent is small. It's like the same size as the, the hole for the ignition. Doesn't seem like very much. I suppose there's not a lot of space on the dash or the vent, but I think the factory ones are more like two and a half inches or something like that. So what I'm gonna do is tape up the dash where I'm gonna drill through it. And hopefully the shavings won't rip the rest of the paint off as they spin around. That's the idea, at least. Also gives me somewhere to mark up with my Sharpie. And I forgot a tape measure. Inch and five-eighths up is that little tiny mark right there. And then an inch and three-quarters over from the edge. Probably will have to use the tape measure this way. Do that. Inch and three-quarters is over here. And that edge of the dash is kind of at this angle. Yeah, inch and three quarters, inch and three quarters. And then we need to come up, yeah, one and five eighths off the bottom. Let's double check that and we'll remark it on our new line, which is right there. So that would make it the center of our drill. All right, here goes nothing. Should I center punch this? Nah. Nah. Now nah, we're good. No going back now. Jesus. It's done. Truck ruined dash totaled shop equals lost well you know this little girl's gonna need a vacuum after this oh.
I wish I could get this to be the volume in your speakers that it is for me. All right, got it cleaned up with the half round. Peel off the tape and see how bad we did. That actually looks pretty decent. I do see a chip right there because this paint is just the highest of quality. But the trim ring, I cover that. That thing fits like an absolute glove. So, so glove like that I can't even get it all the way in. There we go. I do wish that, that was bigger. That is just, it's just the tiniest vent I've ever seen. You know those dinky little round vents in a G6? Like, those are way bigger than this. Yeah, you can end that right at your face. Let's make some more pain. Fling! Smoking. This is going to be me trying to install the driver's side tube. It's going to be really graceful. Me slipping under this dash. Just stick it in. Nope. It's gonna suck. Call my wife to come rescue me. Honey, I'm stuck under the dash again. You come help. <laughs> I say it again because it did happen once before. Well, if this didn't go on a merry adventure on its way over here, I don't know what. It is under the radio, behind the wiper motor, over the column, it's jammed up against the gauge cluster, wrapped up with the oil hard line, low pressure hard line. And now it's going to have to sneak over to this vent. But somebody put an e-brake pedal right in the way. I mutilated my hand, but that's on at least. Hopefully the passenger side is a little easier. This tubing is actually a, a really tight fit on the box, which I, I like. I mean, it's hard to put on, but look through the vent, line it up. Yeah, that's... That's about 400 times easier. I'll run this tube basically right across the front of my ECU. And then just plug it in on the other end. You gotta have to start one side, like, you know, the back side of your tube. Get that on. And then. You just kind of push on the wire and work it around until you got the whole tube all the way on. Yeah, it's in place. Hopefully that fits behind the glove box. Should. All right. I think the next step is to do the center vent. Yeah. Like I said mine's a little different because I'm doing the under dash one, but let me go grab that and see what we have to do to make it work. I swapped out the normal center dash vent, which looks like this one. <clears throat> Comes with this backing piece, and then that's the dash vent you can see. It's actually metal. Swap that out for this, which also comes from Classic Auto Air. I think it was like 15 bucks, And it's just an under dash vent for the center. So it's got the same oval opening as the one included with their kit, but it can be mounted under the dash. I suppose. There's no mounting holes in it. It's just kind of uh, smooth plastic, but you can see it has like a tab. So this is this is my idea for the center vent. Just using the two bolts that hold the AC controls under the dash. <clears throat> Looks like the way it comes in the kit. It's a little bit too narrow for the bolts and a little bit too wide for the washers. So it's kind of just jammed up here in the middle for right now. I'm probably going to go ahead and make a bracket for this. I might 
3D print this bracket. I'm not entirely sure if I want to do that. I do have a 3D printer, a decent ACAD. I could measure those two bolt holes and, and make a bracket for this. But then that would cause it to sit down even further, the thickness of the bracket. And then I don't know how I'd attach it. Maybe a couple self-tappers or something down into the top from the other bracket. And then have that bolt up here. I suppose that would probably work. Yeah, so I'll measure those and I get something going on the printer and bolt that up later on. And I'll circle back and show you guys that when we get there. Moving on to the condenser. Siding. So there's a variety of things here. A couple of flattened washers. Some other brackets. The brackets have part numbers on the instructions, but of course not on the not on the, the real world. And then this bottom left bracket goes one of two ways and doesn't show you which way. I would say it goes towards you based on how this one looks. Lay the condenser down so the hose connection is on the left side, the larger connection on the top. The dryer is conveniently mounted to the left hand side of the condenser. Neat. Said dryer. And there's a bracket for it. First, insert the dryer into the dryer mounting bracket. Okay. Attach the dryer liquid tube to the dryer, which is the U-shaped pipe. I'm guessing it's this one. We have two O-rings that are about the same size. Hopefully those are right. My little tiny bottle of mineral oil. I'll put some oil on the O-ring. Now, since this is supposed to be done with a certified AC technician, not a certified automotive technician, we get to use the Swedish knot lathe. Because that's how a certified AC technician would take care of this problem. Screw the high pressure switch into the port on the top of the dryer and plug in the harness. All right, I talked to tech support. There's another reason why their instructions are not that great. The high pressure switch actually goes in the back of the dryer, well, the back of mine because the way I installed it, where this little bolt is located. This is where the the dryer, or sorry, the, uh, the this port right here is where the pressure switch goes into the dryer. The instructions don't really mention that, they just said it goes into the top, well the top's the side glass, so you can't really do that. So. I need to now take the dryer back out, flip it around, and install the pressure switch kind of hanging off the front. Well, this fastener is a Chinesium spec for sure. The closest thing I got is a 6.14. That seems to fit it pretty well. 9 16 doesn't quite fit it right. Okay. Why was that made that hard? Did I make it hard? Probably. Should I just remove the bolt? I tried that first, probably. It didn't seem like it wanted to come out. Now if you guys went on Amazon or Classic Auto or whoever, or Vintage Air, and you picked up the trinary switch, that's a little different. That's It's larger up here, and it has four wires coming out of it instead of a two pin connection. Um, those don't really seem to come with a wiring diagram. So what I was, 
was able to find is that the black wires act like the two pins that are on this one and the blue wires act like the second part of the trinary switch but i don't know that for sure and have not tested it i was just doing research so i could wire up mine and then i realized that since the classic auto air has that second lead coming off the ac trigger i'm just going to use that as my my trigger switch instead of using the the trinary switch now that could cause the fans to come on when the ac is not actually running if it's cycling but i don't care i mean if i've requested ac i want those fans to be on came with some walmart connectors approved It's got a nice little waterproof connector on it. Okay. Well, small distraction there, but uh, hey, that's that's on. Now I'm going to go take out my transmission cooler. Great. Next up is to install that condenser, but I have a transmission cooler in the way that's got to come out first. I'm going to try the magnet figure. I'm not sure if you guys have ever seen this before. You just take a little magnet, rare earth if you got it, cheap crap if you got it, like me, tape it to your finger, stick the nut to the magnet. The advantage of it being a weak magnet is that it's not getting stuck to everything else. But yeah, it's still getting stuck to everything else. See how well this works? Just look at this. Sweet life hacks. Then a hole has to be drilled in the side here, kind of next to the radiator, where this hard line comes out of the condenser. So we gotta mark that here, take this all back out, and drill it, and put it. I'm gonna have to just kind of eagle eye where this goes and do the best I can to get it centered front to back top to bottom so I can drill that hole in there. Unfortunately, I don't have to pull my bolts back out that I just put in. All right, I'm supposed to drill an absolutely massive one and three eighths hole, which is That's actually the size of my largest step drill bit. Here's what I would suggest. 
don't put this top left bracket on until you've tightened this hose because it's completely in the way. With this bracket out of the way, it's not that bad to tighten this connection up. This is one of the things about having the rat out too. You know, if you had your rat out, it wouldn't be that bad. Hey guys, I live in the loudest neighborhood in the world. Alright, now there's this weird line here that goes on. It hooks to the dryer and then it hooks to the firewall through this, or sorry, the, hooks to the core support through this big hole. There's uh, two washers in the kit. So it goes through the hole with the washer on both sides. like so and then it kind of loops in around behind the dryer and threads onto it maybe these you know these lines they're close with their their bending it's just, i wouldn't say it's perfect but they're close yeah go ahead and thread that on to the dryer and then try to put it through the hole gonna make life easier so here's the tube we just put on runs down into the core support there it is Watch the sun coming through so see there's that hole just in front of it the washer won't fit through the hole so you have to reach around with the washer put it on but presumably the tubes gonna go through that hole once they're connected um, my battery is gonna have to come out it's definitely in the way Well, the next step is just to go ahead and finish. No, that's that's neat. Uh, no, that's to uh, install the compressor kit. So I'm going to get my rad put back up together, and then probably the trans cooler, and then we can actually start on the compressor. Yeah. I think I need to clearance the battery box and bring the tube away from the radiator. And of course now the tube's already installed. So a really good chance I'm gonna cut it trying to clearance this and then just be real hurt. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I'm definitely going to screw something up with this. In summary, I ended up cutting the corner of the battery box there to make some more room for this hose. It was going to be pinched really tightly between the radiator and the battery box. So I just cut the box. It's still close to the red. Ooh, shadow. Oh, that's good. There we go. But I have some hose on it here. It's, it's held pretty well, but it's not to where it's going to like rub through. The rubber hose should protect it. And then it's got clearance up here against the core support and it is not rubbing on the holes there there's that hole not rubbing on that hole either so should be in a pretty good spot there it's a little bit weird next to the battery and next to my coolant overflow but i think it's gonna work just fine with the transmission cooler debacle completed put back together we can go ahead and start on the compressor bracket and the compressor I got these tools when I did the LS swap these are clean out tools 
assorted holes. They're not taps, but they're they have like little release cuts in them, kind of like a tap does. The intention is just you run them in, run them out, and it cleans the hole, cleans out paint and dirt and stuff like that that's in the hole. Now, Classic Auto Air includes this uh, AC compressor mount kit from Allen Grove. Um, it's a little bit complicated to put together. There's a lot of pieces that have to kind of be held all at the same time. I have already painted this kit as well, so pieces are black to match the rest of the stuff around here. Looks like this piece goes on first. Some spacers involved. Not flange bolts. They have larger heads. This is a 17 millimeter head on it. And that's reverse. That kind of tightened. I'm trying to hold this plate into alignment where it needs to go. That looks good. So then this other plate goes on with bolts kind of at the same time. That's the only bolt that goes in the back plate by itself. The other plate has these bolts that go through it and into the head. So there's one bolt that goes up here. It's like a 110 millimeter bolt and then a spacer, and then another spacer. Slot this in here. See if I can get one of the back ones in. Keep everything held into alignment while we get the front ones going. get to watch me either succeed or fail at this I really have no semblance of an idea of what I'm doing I watched a YouTube video on this tool I've never used it before it's not even really my tool I'm borrowing it from a friend so yeah let's uh, let's like find out what happens I got the hose all the way in I got the tool lined up kind of with the back of the fitting. And they basically said you're done when all the dies are touching. Like that. I mean, you, you can feel the hydraulic cylinder just, just stop. When it's done, you need, it's like using a press, you know when it's done. So I did put a little bit of a hooey in it right there, but I mean, I crimped it. It's not coming off. It's very thoroughly squished. Poop some of the included mineral oil on the o-ring and onto the fitting slip the o-ring on 
You guys can't see a thing, I'm sure. I'll get you swapped around. Look, it's Brian. Apparently I wasn't answering my texts. Good? How are you doing? Okay. Oh. I I crimped I crimped a, a, a fitting. Is it right? Oh. <laughs> Find out when you try to charge it, I guess. Yeah. Find out real fast. So this fitting, this has a aluminum core that goes in the hose. Just like that. And then that sleeve just gets crimped. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Looks like it's at the, about the right angle. Right there. Yeah, should be fine. Just want to make sure I have it clocked yeah, you correctly. Yeah, you can't angle it up and down without you know, possibly making the seal not work on the other end. So. Right. All right. Okay, so then this it's it's a little it's a lot. To, to, Does it have yeah different inserts for different sizes? Yeah. I didn't even check to see if we have all the sizes, but it's got this size. I mean, based on the amount that it left on the crimp, I'd say that looks about like what I would be expecting. Yeah. You know, I think a better crimper might not have left a little pinch there, but. Well, the, yeah, I mean, that's that thing that I got for uh, doing those uh, big connectors and stuff. Um, they say basically you, the cheap ones leave those ridges and the expensive ones don't. Yeah. But the difference between that and like the $150 tool and the $800 tool is cosmetic. <laughs> Not worth it. All right, it's going in. And it's not like you use like a hydraulic press. You kind of just pump it until it stops. And then you keep going and it explodes. Or until the cylinder bursts. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Right, that's a damage. Q's nice tools. That, yeah. that, that dog will hunt. There we go. So then... You gotta put on the correct size O-ring out of the bag. How do you know? Ugh. When it goes on correctly. They're all green because of the seat. Right. I never looked up the difference in the material, like why are they green versus not, but I don't know. Maybe it's the brand. No, it's all the AC ones I've seen are green. Hmm. So then you take some of this mineral oil they provided and poop it onto the o-ring along with all the other oil that's on your hand i do like that it's these metric o-ring fittings instead of like a flare fitting or something that's a lot more prone to leaking As a safety precaution, I've been using the stubby. My torque wrench is a little off. Has a tendency to round out the threads. The armometer is usually pretty accurate. I just don't know how tight is tight. Like, what does it need? I don't know. Because if you move this hose back, it loosens. You should find out. Yeah. Just mark it and see if it came loose at all after driving with vibrations and whatnot. Although, if it comes loose, it'll leak it. Yeah. So probably. In a real damn thing. All right, let's get these other ones crimped. I just kind of spent some time debating how I wanted to do the middle size hose, the number eight hose. I uh, still not 100% sure, but this end definitely has to go on. So. We'll put this one on and do some more thinking.
Sorry about that. The mic cut out right at the end of that other clip, and well, the truck's back in the garage now because it's the next day. So let me get you caught up with what changed. In the last clip, we saw the final line being put on. Um, only a couple of things changed after that. I reinstalled my cruise. I just used some nut certs and drilled the holes not in my cruise. That wiring harness is there. That's not really anything to do with the AC project. And then I also made a new mount for my air cleaner that just goes off of the, the bracket for the AC. And then uh, I did have it charged already. Got a wire hanging out there. Let's put that back. I did have it charged already by a family member. They took care of that for me. Is fantastic. I don't have a recording of that because it happened at a, at a shop. So no recording of the, the charging process. Sorry. I'm sure there's already a bunch of videos on YouTube on how to do that. And even if I did record it, probably wouldn't have shown you how to do it since I didn't do it, right? A, a shop did it. So nothing exciting there. I did end up 3D printing the bracket for my center vent. It just hits those two bolts and then the center vent is screwed onto it from the top, which you can't see anymore. I can take this 3D model and put it online and make the link available in case anybody wants to use it. It's, it's real simple. It's just a thin little piece of plastic that hits those two holes. But hey, somebody can benefit from it. I'm happy to share that. And then I did also install the glove box did also install the glove box. Of course, my stuff's already packed in there, but you can see it's significantly smaller than the factory glove box, but that's okay because all my stuff still fits and I have air. So that's pretty sweet. There was one other component I didn't touch on, which was the wire for the compressor. So what I did is I just ran a wire out the same hole as the water control valve. It runs down this line through the fender and eventually comes back to the pressure switch there's no polarity just use one leg or the other and then the other leg follows this hose and comes back to my compressor can't really see with all the stuff in the way but anyway it's plugged into the compressor so it's just one single wire that runs from that white wire but where your unit is out to this pressure switch and then back to the compressor all right, well, I think that pretty much wraps up the install of the Classic Auto Air. I've been driving around now for a little bit with it, and it's pretty darn nice. It's not really hot out yet. It's like 90s, high 80s, and it's keeping me nice and comfortable inside the truck. Um, it works kind of like an air unit would in a vehicle that's probably 10 years old. So we have a brand new car, and it's definitely colder than the truck is. That thing is super comfortable. Um, but like I had a 2013 Subaru, this is pretty much exactly the same as that. You know, it cycles on and off. You might feel less cold air while it's cycling, cycles back on, you get the cold air. Good enough. It keeps you nice and comfy. Um, the blower fan is very strong. It, it's noisy, but, uh, over my truck, it's really not that big of a deal because it's already a noisy truck anyway. There's no insulation on the floor, which probably should get fixed because my cold air is getting out without having any insulation. Other than that, I think the, the kit was pretty good. I mean, it wasn't perfect. The instructions definitely were not perfect, but it got done in the end and everything seems to work. And then I wouldn't say there's any quality issues with the, the AC or the blower part. You know, it's more of like, hey, this little bracket's not right or this instruction didn't say I need to cut the battery box, but little stuff like that. Anyway, thank you guys for watching. Hope to see you again on PowerShell Garage soon. We have some other projects going on. Uh, I will be doing some rust repair on the C10, so hopefully get some of that recorded. Replacing floor pans is boring, but we can time lapse it. Also have some other projects coming up that you guys haven't seen yet. Um, they've been going kind of slow. I haven't had really had enough content for a whole video yet because I like to do these longer format videos. But once that's ready to go, we'll have something out. And then we do have another revival video too that's been in the works for a while. Hopefully that'll be coming out soon.